Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here again for another multi multi center echo teaching sessions. Today, we have a very special guest. We are going to be discussing about um, aortic valve repair. Um, it's a very very interesting talk, and uh, we have a new we have new informations coming up, and uh, and you're going to have a, like a hopefully a pretty good discussion about this topic. And we have a very special guest, Dr. Annette Vegas. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Vegas, she's professor of anesthesiology here at University of Toronto, staff cardiovascular anesthesiology and critical care physician at Toronto General Hospital, and also director of perioperative TE program also at TGH. Among many other teaching activities, Dr. Vegas has a special interest in echocardiography and has developed web-based educational materials, especially the PI Med Toronto, for teaching both, both teaching both TEE and also TTE. She has extensive public published journal articles and book chapters, and authored test textbooks and co-edited textbooks related to echocardiography. Dr. Vegas, thank you very much for being here. Um, we are really happy. We are really happy for uh, for having you here. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you now, and I'm going to uh, mute myself. Thanks, Fabio. Um, you should start to see my screen. Um, yes, I can see your screen. But it's excellent. Not and yeah. I'm hoping you can hear me very well. Thanks very mm -hmm. much to Fabio and Raphael for the kind invitation to speak today on the topic of aortic valve repair decision making. Over the course of today's uh, session, what we hope to do is to use a case-based approach to look at cases involving sparing of the native aortic valve. Uh, we're also going to review some classification guidelines for the assessment of the mechanisms of AI, managing AI, aortopathy from the American Heart Association, how to assess the bicuspid aortic valve, and how to assess for aortic valve sparing procedures. We're going to use mostly TE images in the context of surgical literature and best practices to explore these topics. I have no disclosures or competing interests, and I'd like to share today with one of my colleagues, Dr. Chris Weindell. Uh, Chris is uh, one of our uh, cardiovascular surgeons who really is a pioneer in the topic of aortic valve sparing procedures. Uh, he recently retired and uh, fortunately was gracious enough to accept this invitation. So as we present the cases, I'll elicit his opinion about uh, how a surgeon thinks and, and what a surgeon would do in this situation. So the first case we're going to present is a typical case that you might see in your operating room. It's an 80-year-old female who's asymptomatic, has comorbidities of hypertension, on transthoracic echo was found to have an aortic aneurysm and aortic insufficiency. A CT scan confirmed the presence of the aortic aneurysm. It involved the ascending aorta and the proximal arch. Have a look at these clips and see what you think. One question to answer is, what two abnormalities do you see uh, on the 2D image in the mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view? Think about what the mechanism of AI is in this patient. So for those of you who were eagle-eyed, you recognize one abnormality right away, and that was the dilated ascending aorta here past the STJ. The other abnormality is an aberrant or abnormal coronary artery, which may influence how the surgeon chooses to manage this patient. We're going to start with poll question one. The question is, how would you quantify in your operating room the grade of AI in this patient? You can choose as many choices as you think. Another 10 seconds and I'm going to end the pool. 
Okay, five, four, two, two, one. I'm gonna end the pool. And we're gonna, I'm gonna share the results with you, Dr. Vegas. So 24% said vena contracta, 29% said, said relation between the jet height and LVOT diameter, 10% pressure half time, 33% arch reversal, and 5% regurgitant volume. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Okay, so there really is no right answer here, and, and many people will use multiple techniques to grade AI. All right, I'm just trying to advance my slides here. Okay, so in this patient, we can look at vena contracta, and remember, as you're trying to make these measurements, it's important to zoom in and try and get uh, a nice uh, flow acceleration vena contracta and jet area here as shown here. And the vena contracta here uh, measures seven millimeters. If you were to do the jet height to LVOT area, that comes out to 31%. If you're looking at pressure half time, it's 405, and there is no aortic uh, reversal in this patient. So if we were just to use these simple measurements, we would have severe based on vena contracta, moderate based on jet height and pressure half time, and there's no descending aorta reversal. Uh, most of us don't use quantification, but you can use quantification in this uh, patient. You can go to the transgastric views as shown here, and this is a deep transgastric view showing the AI jet, which fortunately lines well with, um, with spectral Doppler. So here you can measure the vena contracta, um, uh, sorry, the uh, PISA hemisphere, uh, and it comes out to 0.6. You can measure the the uh, aortic regurgitation, and you look at the VTI here, and depending on the software on your machine, you can actually plug all these values in, and you can see on the screen here, this was automatically calculated for us. In this case, the ROA was 0.18, and the regurgitant volume was 46 millimeters, all of which suggests this patient has at least moderate AI. So is there literature to support what we should be doing in the operating room? And I'm sure you're aware of these 2020 guidelines that came out in JACE, uh, um, published by Nakora et al. And if you read the fine print, uh, I was one of the authors on this paper. But really what it comes down to is what do we need to do interoperatively to assess for aortic valve surgery? And the reality is that we can look at aortic valve anatomy um, and to evaluate aortic valve function we should use simple tests. And the ones that we've done here, vena contracta, pressure half time, and aortic flow reversal are the ones that are recommended for interoperative assessment. In the post-repair period, uh, we should evaluate anatomy, evaluate aortic valve function, LV function, and coronary uh, flow, and coronary uh, left ventricular wall motion abnormalities. So we'll go into a little bit of detail in some of this as we progress along in the talk. So poll number two, based on the echo findings and the Elkuri functional AI classification, what is the mechanism of AI? Is it type one A, B, C, D, two, or three? Okay, another 10 seconds. Five. Okay, I'm gonna end the pool. So Dr. Vegas, 53% said type 1A, 12% type 1B, 18% type 1C, and 12% type 2 and also 6% type three. Let me stop sharing. Okay, so the L, the L Curry classification, let's see if I can advance my slide here. So the L Curry classification is a classification popularized by one of the Belgian cardiac surgeons. It was really published uh, in 2005. 
And what they try to do is look at the mechanisms of AI, similar to you would be looking at the mechanisms of mitral regurgitation. So they classified it into three types, type one, two, and three. Type one has normal cusp motion and can be related to functional aortic dilatation or cusp perforation. Type two is related to cusp prolapse and type three is related to cusp retraction or calcified cusps. Within type one, there are four subtypes and it really depends on where the root is dilated or where the aorta is dilated. So type one is distal to the STJ, type 1B is involving the aortic root and type 1C involves the aortic annulus. Type 1D reflects perforation. So this functional classification was brought into play largely because increasingly people are doing aortic valve um, or valve sparing procedures. And it gave um, echocardiographers and cardiologists and cardiac surgeons common language to talk about some of the mechanisms involved with AI. Uh, it's important to remember that a mechanism is not the etiology and we still have to search for the underlying reason for why a patient has AI. So let's look at the mechanism in case one. We look at the aortic valve long axis. We see up close that the cusps actually look like they're co-opting well. Um, and the problem really has to do with the aorta. And if we make our measurements, we see a systolic annular measurement of 2.2. And remember the remaining measurements should be, should be measured in diastole. And while the recommending the recommendations are leading edge to leading edge, I think most people use inner edge to inner edge. And you can see the measurements as listed here. The STJ and the aortic annulus uh, and the ascending aorta are both dilated. So this is in fact a type 1A L. Curry classification. So how do we manage AI and aortopathy? Well, there are guidelines out there and these are the American Heart Guidelines. They came out in 2021. And for patients with AI, they consider suggesting surgery if the patient has severe AI, if the patient is symptomatic, if the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 55%, and if the left ventricular and systolic diameter, not diastolic, but systolic diameter is greater than 50 millimeters. It's a class two indication with moderate AI as our patient has if they're coming for other surgery. But the reality is this patient is in the operating room for another reason. They have an ascending thoracic aorta aneurysm. And this is the most recent 2022 in-press guidelines from the Journal of the American Cardi College of Cardiology and again, AHA guidelines, ACC guidelines. And their current recommendations are for sporadic uh, and bicuspid aortic valve aneurysms to consider surgery when the ascending aorta is greater than 55 and in Morphans when it's greater than 50 millimeters. So poll number three, what operation should this patient have? And sure, we'll have Dr. Feindel weigh in on what he thinks the operation should be, but we'll poll the audience first. Okay. In five seconds. In two, one. Another five seconds. There are more people still voting. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna end the poll, and I'm gonna share results. So twenty percent said dental, AVR, and ascending aorta. 35% replacement of the aorta, 45% valve sparing, and yeah, that's it, 45, 35, and 20. Okay, Chris, how about, how about it? You've got an eight-year-old who's asymptomatic, has a dilated ascending aorta greater than six uh, centimeters, moderate central AI, and a tricuspid aortic valve. What would you recommend the patient have done? Thanks, Annette. Um... Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yours Good. sound great. Good. Um, 80 years old, first of all, just let me comment, a valve sparing route is certainly 
an option. It is a more technically challenging operation. It takes a longer time. And of course, time on the heart-lung machine, as you well know, as you get older, is harder on the individual. So I would be loath to expose her to a valve sparing operation. And of course, the whole idea of that is you have a valve that's going to last many years without anticoagulation. But at 80 years old, I think that the risk benefit is not worth it. When you said replacement of the aorta, I assume you meant replacement of the ascending aorta. It wasn't quite clear. Yes. Um, uh, so let's just pass back to A, which is the bentol, which is an AVR, an aortic root, the whole aortic root replacement with the ascending aortic replacement. That's not as challenging and as uh, tough as a valve sparing root, but it's still a big operation. Um, and I think the main reason that this patient's here is because of her ascending aorta, which puts her at a significant rip risk of death from rupture. I think the it's a judgment call as to how bad the AI is. I would suspect that you will not make the AI better if you just correct the sinotubular junction, but I highly suspect you'll make it significantly less. And at 80 years old, you can tolerate that AI. She was also already asymptomatic, so she's not having symptoms from her AI. And I would push for a fairly straightforward and fairly quick operation, which would be replacement of the ascending aorta uh, from the anominate artery down to the sinotubular junction, which will correct some of the AI, probably not all of it. You just don't have enough leaflet or uh, leaflet material to do a valve sparing route, I don't think. A Ross procedure, that would be a fantasy. And she's not there for her, AV, her aortic valve, she's there for her aneurysm. So I would vote for B. Okay, so let's see what our intrepid surgeon did. So our intrepid surgeon replaced the ascending aorta. Uh, and just the ascending aorta, leaving the native valve intact. So again, um, the patient ends up with um, probably the same amount of AI uh, as they did before. Uh, so Chris, any comments about the amount of AI and worrying about this amount of AI in an 80-year-old? Not particularly. I think uh, her heart size is, yes, her heart size is normal. I think this is uh, probably likely she's had this for a long time and she could tolerate this. Okay. Any questions or comments from the audience? Yes, I do have a question. Um, Dr. Fendel, um, in regards to this patient, what would be the limit in terms of age for you to consider um, try to do a valve repair, a valve sparing, a valve sparing procedure for this patient? That's a good question. Um, I think it uh, really depends on the patient's overall physiology. Uh, so a uh, healthy individual, uh, you know, 65 or less, you would certainly consider a valve sparing. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not in this patient. I, I'm not sure a valve sparing would be successful in this patient. Mm -hmm. uh, but to your point, I would say 65. I mean, Age, age thresholds are shifting, as you know, as we all get older, we keep shifting the threshold. So a healthy 70-year-old, I think it's worthwhile. If you're comfortable doing a valve sparing operation, it's not going to end up being a prolonged pump run. Uh, and the heart, they don't have coronary disease and heart function is good. When you start adding other things such as coronary disease or, or reduced heart function, mm -hmm. which is, I think that becomes quite a different situation. Okay. I mean, valve sparing is, uh, it's an ideal operation, but it's, you know, not necessarily the right thing for everyone. But I, I would say a good 65 to 70 year old is worth, it's worthwhile. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go on to case two. So this is a 19 year old male, so substantially younger with Marfan syndrome. He's asymptomatic and has been followed serially um, through the aortopathy clinic here. He has a mild AI and is noted to have an aortic root aneurysm of 55 millimeters on transthoracic echo, which was also confirmed to be 58 millimeters on CT scan. 
And these are his aortic valve long axis views here. So have a look at these views. And this is a short axis views. All right, so let's go to the mechanism of AI here. So very similar to our first patient, when we do our measurements, we get an annular measurement of 25 and measurements in diastole of a sinus of 4.7 and an STJ closer to 5.3. The ascending aorta, which I'm not showing here, was actually quite normal at 3.5 centimeters. So in this case, the um, L. Curry mechanism is type 1B, where we have dilatation of the aortic root, which needs to be addressed. So poll number four, and you knew this was coming, what operation should this patient have? And you have a chance to weigh in. And again, in that replacement of the aorta, I'm assuming you mean replacement of the ascending aorta. Ascending aorta, aorta. yes. Right. Thank you. Okay, another 10 seconds. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna stop. So Chris, what do you think? Um, so let me just, Annette. Um, sure. Show the answer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So 74% of sparing. 17%, 17% dental, 4% replacement of ascending aort, and 4% ROS. All right, Chris, 19 years old, asymptomatic. This, these are fairly common patients in our practice here at the general, thanks to you and Dr. David. So um, any thoughts about this type of patient? Well, again, the, the, uh, this patient is here because uh, he has Marfan syndrome and he's got a dilated aortic root and he's at a high risk uh, of dissection uh, down the road. And uh, at being at age 19, you really don't want to have to give him an artificial valve, in particular a mechanical valve, which will commit him to lifelong Coumadin. And the other thing I think is a little bit misunderstood when people say a mechanical valve will last your lifetime, that's not necessarily true. And I know the anesthesiologists here have seen us having to reoperate on mechanical valves that get into trouble because of a panis. So it's not a totally benign uh, situation. So definitely in this case, uh, aortic valve sparing root would be the ideal uh, approach to helping this young man. Uh, the valve leaflets, although they're thinned out and they likely will be stretched out, they appear to be normal. There may be some fenestrations in them, which you would likely accept depending in, on what they're like. But I think he would be ideal for a, an aortic root sparing operation. I would not do a Ross operation because uh, all you're going to do is replace uh, a part of the aortic root be better to replace the aorta right up to the, even to the anominate probably. Right, so we've all already sort of delved into this a little bit. So, and Chris can sort of respond a little bit here. So what are some of the indications to do a valve sparing procedure? And, and these are a list that, um, uh, that I came up with. And it's sort of symptomatic patients with congestive heart failure, asymptomatic patients who have dilated left ventricles, and really it reflects more of a problem with the aorta. So they either have type A dissections, they have aneurysms or aortopathies, depending on the origin of the aortopathy. And we talked about, uh, you know, the age limits and, and the moving shifting stand part of the age limits, ages less than 60, you might consider an aortic valve and, and ascending aorta. Um, and patients who have severe AI and root enlargements. Contraindications, obviously, lack of surgical expertise, abnormal cusps, poor left ventricular function, coronary disease, which may prolong the surgery, and bicuspid aortic valves in the older age group patients. Any comments, Chris, about what you think 
and when you think aortic valve should be spared? Well, I think these are very reasonable. Um, the uh, if the valve can be salvaged, then I think it, it, it. And you have the surgical expertise, then it should should be spared. Um, if if you don't have the surgical expertise, I think it's a, it behooves you to refer to a surgeon or a center that has the expertise. But that expertise is increasing slowly across the country. Um, the the First of all, it was thought for many years that if you have a bicuspid aortic valve, you should have the threshold to address an ascending aortic aneurysm of around 50. That guideline has really changed. It was simply a guideline. There was not really a ton of evidence to support that. So we now use 55 millimeters as the cutoff. Again, you know, these measurements are somewhat arbitrary. Uh, and I, we sometimes, uh, some of us rely very much on what the aorta looks like. So if I saw an aorta that was uh, gradually dilating uh, in an older person and then gradually come down to a normal size, that's quite different, I, at least in my opinion, than a very eccentrically dilated aorta with a bulge out one side, which just empirically, I think, is more at risk of a dissection. So I, I do think the morphology of the ascending aorta is certainly helpful in surgeons uh, from a surgical perspective. And there's there's more and more uh, studies looking at the actual morphology rather than these uh, somewhat artificial measurements, but that's what we've had and used in the past. Um, so Chris, can you comment here? Because this is one of the, again, experts in, in valve sparing procedures. And, and he says the key question is not if the valve can be spared, but will the preserved aortic valve function well for 10 years or longer? Sorry, if they've... Well, so, I can't see that it's covering. Sorry, this. it says the key uh, question is not if the valve can be spared, but will the preserved aortic valve function well for 10 years or longer? So it's, a, it's more about durability. Right, so a tricuspid valve that's uh, spared should last longer than 10 years we know that it does a bicuspid valve you're at so you're at really the mercy of what happens to that bicuspid valve so a true bicuspid valve a series zero would is likely got the best chance of of lasting a long time uh, bicuspid valves with uh you know, distortion in the leaflets have a much less chance of uh, surviving a long time. And then you're, of course, exposing the patient to another operation down the road. And often these are young people and or even middle-aged people. If you have a discussion with the patient, they're often, they may not be that interested in, you know, the risk of a future operation. Nobody would be. I think that's what you're asking me, Annette. I wasn't quite clear yeah. on that question. Well, no, I think it, you know, many times surgeons in the operating room will feel pleased that they've, you know, accomplished a repair. And sometimes it's like, oh, good, we've done the operation, the patient's leaving with what we think is a good result. But in fact, it turns out to be a less than durable result for perhaps anatomical reasons and or functional reasons. And we have a case later on that we can we can explore this a little bit with. All right, so from an echocardiographic perspective though, are there measurements, are there things the surgeon needs to know beforehand? And this is really an evolving literature that's come out in the last few years. And really what the French group has identified are measurements that we can take that will help our surgeon uh, during valve sparing procedures. And perhaps not the more experienced uh, surgeon, but perhaps the, the lesser experienced surgeon. And what they're recommending is to measure things like the, the annulus, which we can measure in systole, and three other measurements that we don't normally make. Uh, so, sorry, we make the annular measurements, we make the STJ measurements, and three measurements that we don't usually make. And these are things like the geometric height. And the geometric height is really from the cusp insertion point to the tip of the, um, the cusp measured during diastole. We can measure coaptation height or coaptation length, uh, again, measured in diastole. 
And we can measure something called effective height, which is the distance between the annulus. And remember, this is a sort of not a true annulus but where the leaflets or the cusps insert to the end of the coaptation point. And measurements such as those shown here indicate that it's more likely the valve can be spared. The German group have gone further and suggested not only should you make these 2D measurements, but you should make them really using a 3D data set. And the 3D data set looks at nine to 12 measurements that you make. Um, all those four measurements I, I suggested before using different permutations and combinations, and you should be able to look at the coaptation length between the non and the left and the left and the right and the non and the right. You can look at effective heights and you can look at geometric heights for each of the valve uh, cusps. So Chris, I know you and I had a hallway conversation about this, but what do you think about these measurements that um, are, are now being presented in the literature for echocardiographers to use interoperatively? I think they are, to your point, I think they are very valuable um, as people learn more and more about valve sparing root surgery, and especially for uh, newer, uh, you know, people learning the procedure at, at this time. We, of course, didn't really have any of this when we, we started off doing these operations, but I think it is very worthwhile to to do the measurements because it allows us to share common language when we're looking at different cases across even around the world when people are getting sort of uh, consults on cases. Uh, I must say I've never actually done that, used the caliper to measure leaflets, and I know Tyrone hasn't either, but I know Dr. Azunian and Dr. Chung do, and I think they feel very comfortable with that. So it's, a, it's perhaps a bit of a generational thing, I guess. Okay, great. So I will say again at our institution, we're, we're not necessarily always going to uh, measure all of these or take all these measurements. Um, we certainly don't use 3D data sets, but I, I think that's an evolving technology. And I think as we get better with 3D imaging and be able to uh, produce these measurements quickly, we, we probably uh, could and should be, be doing them. So let's look at case two again and try and figure out how repairable this valve is. And if we do the measurements as we've done here, we, we look at the annulus, which is 25, uh, the effective height, which is 17. And again, nine should be the, the lowest number that you see, commissural height, which is nine. And uh, that should be a minimum of five. And the geometric height for the right and non, which you measure in the long axis view, and that's well over 20 in both, uh, both cusps. So this looks like a fairly favorable valve to repair. So Chris, I put this video in because uh, I think a lot of people don't really uh, have the chance to see aortic valve sparing procedures. And I think the video will, will go a little quickly, but, but maybe you can highlight some of the key points uh, about valve sparing procedures. Well, for, first of all, you're looking at this from the surgeon's perspective. So anesthesiology would be looking at uh, the left side of this. And this is this is done very quickly. So already the diseased aorta has been removed. The Dacron graft has been placed down and the uh, spared aortic, the native aortic valve, the commissures were were set up to, <laughs> this is really moving fast. Um, <laughs> And uh, and we're done. <laughs> um, so you, you you could probably see the 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 this is the old fashioned saline test. You saw the the saline being injected. And we're going to run it again. Great. I think you could probably do it. You do two. You could do a lot of surgery in one day if you do it this fast. So there's the leaflets. We're looking at the leaflets. They're nice and symmetric, all three of them. And now we've taken out the diseased aorta, and the three commissures are placed inside the Dacron graft. This is where the art of this operation occurs. It's a, quite challenging to get this right. And then the aortic layer is sewn up. This is the hemostatic layer. The coronary buttons are re-implanted. This is our saline. This was our early uh, poor man's echo. We didn't really have uh, 
good echo in the OR years ago, but it's a pretty effective test. And the surgeons, or at least our surgeons, still use this today and get very anxious if, it's, uh, if it shows that the valve's leaking. That's great, Annette. We could do 10 of these a day. Oh, no. It's, <laughs> it's sort of moving at the speed of light. So you mentioned some of the technical challenges. And, and you know, this is sort of some illustrations that perhaps show this, that if you put the post too high versus too low or you twist the post a little bit, that it's not surprising you can get AI. And one of the challenges we have in the post pop is to determine the mechanism of the AI. So, Annette, just to comment on that, this is, uh, I think, I've you know, with with the younger surgeons taking over this uh, and learning about this procedure and now doing quite well with it, this is clearly the most challenging part of this surgery is how to position the commissures to get them on the, both the horizontal and the vertical plane because both of those will affect, uh, impact on leaflet coaptation. And you show quite rightly there on the right, there's a floppy cusp because if the commerces are not correctly positioned, you can end up with distortion. Um, I think that if there's any particular artistic part of this uh, operation, this is it. And this is also a time for a surgeon uh, to back out if you feel that this is not going to work. Don't go ahead and do all the coronary implantations and everything else only to find out the operation has failed and now you have to add a lot more cross clamp time to change it to a bentol. So again, the, the post assessment is as important and you will often see this thickened root and there's an element of uh, cusp coaptation uh, that implies durability. So you wanna see the cusp coap above the annular plane. You wanna see a coaptation height of at least five millimeters and an effective height of at least nine millimeters, all of which should be measured. You wanna make sure there's no more than mild AI speaking to durability and that ventricular function does not have specifically regional wall motion abnormalities, which would imply there's a problem with one of the coronary buttons. And Annette, to your point, I think the, the right coronary artery typically seems to be, or can be more problematic than the left. They're often um, uh, quite small and very easy. It's very easy to unintentionally kink it or do something that will compromise the blood flow. So that is a coronary flow is, is very important. And you, you see it very, you see it instantly if there's a problem, obviously. So the surgeon did this operation. It was a valve sparing procedure here. Um, they had a very, very good result. So the effective height measured here is 1.5. The coaptation height is 1.09. The coaptation is well below the annular plane, and there's really very, very little AI, maybe a little commissural AI there between the non and the right. Um, I will say seldom do our images look so crisp. This happens to be one of our better uh, photogenic patients, shall we say. Usually they're filled with bubbles and all sorts of other things, and the surgeon is desperately trying to ask us how well things are going. Um, this is the transgastric use, and remember, you don't actually have to always be at zero degrees. Sometimes you can be a little off axis at 70 degrees, but you see a really uh, crisp picture of the aortic valve here, again, confirming everything. Uh, Chris, would you worry about this mild degree of central AI in this patient? Um, I, I I wouldn't overly be overly worried. I think this is acceptable because I think uh, everything else geometrically, it, it, the leaflet coaptation looks very good. It'd be very difficult to imagine how one could improve on this. In other words, if you recross clamp, opened up the aorta and started doing something that would placate leaflets or adjust leaflets, chances are you're going to make it worse. So I would accept this. Great. Okay, we're going to move ahead to case three. Case three is a 33-year-old female who's completely asymptomatic. She has, however, severe aortic insufficiency and a dilated left ventricle. And remember, those were indications to appear in the operating room. So have a look at these images and see if you can figure out what the mechanism of the AI is here. So in the mid-esophageal aortic valve short axis view, there's a bicuspid aortic valve with fusion of the right and left cusps. 
This creates asymmetric cusps. Whoops, I spelled cusps wrong. Sorry about that. And sinuses. And a raphe is present as well, where the cusps are conjoined. In the long axis view, you see prolapse of the fused cusp. And with color, you can see that there's an eccentric posteriorly directed AI jet. Now you can wonder whether that's a bit central, but it looks a lot more like it's eccentric and posterly directed there. So poll number five, based on the echo findings in the L. Curry classification, what is the mechanism of AI in this patient? Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay, five, four. Okay, I'm going to end the pool. And I'm going to share results. Okay, 76% of, of people said type 2. 12% said type 1B. 8% said type 1C, and 4% said type 1G. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so clearly this patient, as we suggested, had some prolapse. And there is prolapse of the fused cusp here. And it's important to recognize that unlike, say, mitral regurgitation, where you, sorry, um, where you have a um, very obvious prolapse, aortic valve prolapse is sometimes very subtle. And this is, in fact, what you see with 2D imaging for uh, prolapse. It's only a partial prolapse. It's not a complete prolapse. So everybody recognized the bicuspid aortic valve. And if I was asking you to classify the bicuspid aortic valve, everybody would use the Sievers classification. And that's based on the number of raphi, and of which there are three types. Type zero with no raphi, type one with one raphi, and type two with two raphi, which often can be confused as the unicuspid aortic valve. By far and away, the most common is type one of which 89% of bicuspid valves are. And within that, there are subtypes. So there's the right left, which is the commonest, the non-right, which is middle, and the non-left, which is the least commonest. The Sievers classification is useful, but it doesn't really help surgeons repair valves. So more recently, last year, there was an international consensus statement on the nomenclature and classification of the congenital bicuspid aortic valve and, and its aortopathy for clinical, surgical, interventional, and research purposes. And what they did was they reclassified the aortic valve into three types. The three types are fused, two sinus, partial fusion, or form frust. And within those, they have phenotypes. So in the next slide, we're gonna look at the different types of aortic valve based on this new consensus classification. So the first is the most common, which is the fused bicuspid aortic valve, which we would think of maybe as a type one uh, Sievers classification. And in, within that, there's two cusps that are joined that are often create asymmetry. There's three phenotypes previously similar to the Sievers classification, three sinuses, and often a raphi is present. The next most common is the two sinus bicuspid aortic valve. Here you have two symmetric cusps, two phenotypes, the lateral lateral and the antero posterior, commissures at 180 degrees, two aortic sinuses, and no raphi. And finally, something called the form pressed, and this really has three symmetric cusps. It has a systolic triangular opening. There's a partially fused raphi of less than 50%, sometimes referred to as a mini raphi. And the commissures appear at 120 degrees. There are three aortic sinuses. So this looks very similar to a tricuspid aortic valve, but in fact, there's a little bit of fusion 
if one of the costumes, two of the costumes. Associated with this classification is also a bicuspid valve aortopathy classification. And dilation of the aortic valve occurs 20 to 30% of patients and occurs in 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 millimeters per year. This classification includes three aortic phenotypes, the ascending, which is the commonest, the root, 20%, and that which is extended into the arch, which could include either the root or the ascending aorta. And the diameters, mild dilatation, less than 45, moderate 46 to 50 to 54, and severe greater than 55. Severe in those with greater than 50 millimeters and risk factors deserve surgery. So management of aortic insufficiency in bicuspid aortic valve is no different than management in tricuspid aortic valve. The indications are the same. In terms of aortopathy, and we've heard this a little bit, the numbers have changed slightly. So patients who have now aortopathy in aorta greater than 55 centimeters deserve, 5.5 um, centimeters deserve surgery. Those that have dilated sinuses and ascending aorta in the 50 to or 5 to 5.5 centimeter range or other indications for aortic valve surgery deserve attention to the aorta. And uh, patients with less or greater than 4.5 can also be considered for surgery. And these are the risk factors that would accelerate whether a patient gets uh, uh, their aorta addressed or not. So the bicuspid valve assessment by TEE, this is an excellent paper by Michalina uh, et al. They're at the Mayo Clinic. And they were also first author on the bicuspid aortic valve consensus document. And they suggest looking at cusp phenotype as previously mentioned. This paper actually came out later than the um, previous paper. So I've kind of taken some of the information from both papers and put it together. So you basically want to look at the cusp uh, phenotype in terms of fused two sinus or form thrust. You want to see whether there are two or three sinuses, asymmetry of the cusp and sinuses, and the presence of a raphi with or without calcium, as shown here. You want to look at the cusp condition to see if they're amenable to be repaired, so mobility, fenestrations, calcification, and prolapse. You want to look at root geometry and measure geometric height and effective height. And for the bicuspid aortic valve, you want to look at something called the non-fused cusp commissural angle, and this becomes important. This is important because it impacts how difficult it is for the surgeon to repair the valve. So if the commissures are closer to 180, it's easier to repair the valve. So if you measure this angle and it's 160 to 180 degrees, chances are greater the surgeon can repair the valve. If it's between 140 and 159, it becomes moderately difficult to repair the valve. And if it's 120 to 140 degrees, it's increasingly more difficult to repair and spare the valve. So you measure this angle in diastole by drawing a line through the center of the valve, and then you draw a line from the commissures, each of the commissures to the center point of that line. And you measure the angle as shown here, and this angle is 170 degrees. So Chris, you're on again. Bicuspid aortic valve, valve sparing procedures. Um, are they more difficult than tricuspid? I've just listed some of the things from an anesthesia perspective that we would understand. But from a surgeon's perspective, is it easier to repair a bicuspid aortic valve or spare a bicuspid aortic valve than a tricuspid aortic valve? No, that's a, <clears throat> uh, definitely not as easy. And uh, here you see a repair taking place. It's a little slower than the previous uh, video. But it, I think the ideal situation is where you've got the commissures 180 degrees apart, which is, is not all that common, as you, as you just indicated. If you have enough leaflet tissue, you can attempt to repair it. Uh, the longevity of these valves is clearly not going to be the same as the tricuspid valve, just because we know from experience that bicuspid valves themselves don't necessarily last the patient's um, life. But in a younger patient, uh, we will you know, definitely try to repair these valves. Uh, 
as long as and, and making sure that the patient's fully aware that this may not be long long lasting. Uh, I think the threshold for repairing these valves, uh, certainly my understanding, varies quite considerably from center to center. So you have a group in Germany that's uh, very aggressive in preserving these valves, taking calcium off and all this sort of stuff with, uh, you know, claims that the, the longevity is very good. We learned years ago uh, by simply, we used to decalcify patients who might be undergoing coronary artery bypass and had noted to have mild aortic stenosis. And if we decalcified those as a almost like a cosmetic procedure in the operating room, those patients seem to come back fairly early within a few years with severe aortic stenosis. So uh, very concerned about uh, any calcification present on these leaflets. So they're definitely much tougher to repair. There's less uh, leaflet overlap to work with. This particular case, I think, is a good one because there's a fair amount of leaflet tissue to work with. All right, so if we apply our science to repairability here, we would get a fused right left cusp. They're asymmetric. There's three sinuses. The Raphi is complete, but it has minimal calcium on it. And the commissural angle, however, is measured at 155 degrees. There is that fused cusp prolapse. There's some eccentric posterior AI. And if you do the measurements, the annulus is quite dilated at 38 millimeters. The effective height is 7.5 millimeters, which is uh, a little bit smaller than what you want. Uh, the commissural height is 5.5, which is fine. And the geometric height, and you measure the geometric height, I should say in a bicuspid aortic valve of the non-fused cusp. So that's fortunately usually the upper or more posterior looking cusp in the aortic valve long axis view. So overall, this should be a repairable valve. And let's see what our intrepid surgeon did. Oh, wait now. Um, so this patient did undergo an aortic valve. I'm gonna skip bowl number six here. Did have a valve sparing procedure. And this is what the results were. So the surgeon excised the raphi, put in a 34 millimeter Dacron graft, did a subaortic annuloplasty to address the annular dilatation, positioned the commissures at 175 to 180 degrees, um, plicated the fused cusp and reinforced the cusp margin. So the post-op echo showed coaptation at the annulus. The co-optation length was nine millimeters. The effective cusp height was nine millimeters. There was trivial AI and the commissural angle was 175. Chris, do you think this is a good valve outcome? Uh, yes, it, it looks pretty good. I, I'm a little bit concerned about the leaflets uh, dropping below the LVOT, into the LV, LVOT from a long-term perspective, but I think it looks pretty good. So, yeah, I mean, there's this controversy and, you know, we were recently at our meeting, we had Schaefer come and speak and virtually at least, and um, there was some concern about this concept of billowing or the cusp bellies um, below the annular plane, but the co-optation point seems to be at or like, you know, at or above the annular plane here. Um, do you have any sort of thoughts about durability in these types of patients? Well, it's it's been said that the durability isn't as long. It's it's actually challenging to get that data because uh, I don't think a lot of this early on was was measured. I suspect with a bicuspid valve in this particular case, you'll have more trouble with actual degener ongoing degeneration of the bicuspid valve, possibly. All right, so we'll accept this as an adequate repair. Yes. Okay. Case number four. This is a 40 year old male. And you can see the theme is these are relatively young patients. They're asymptomatic, severe AI, and a dilated, dilated left ventricle. And again, look at these images to see if you can sort out <clears throat> what the mechanism of the AI is. 
and it's very similar to our previous patient. So there's a fused bicuspid aortic valve right and left. They're asymmetric cusps and sinuses. You really don't see a raphi in this patient. Um, so it's almost like a type two, but not quite. Um, there's definite prolapse of the fused cusp, and you can see that quite evident with the red arrow, um, as well as an eccentric posteriorly directed AI. And if we look at repairability, it's very similar to the previous one. Um, there's fusion of cusp, asymmetric cusp, three sinuses, we don't see a raphi, and commissural angle is closer to 180, which is more favorable. The annulus is not as dilated, 27 millimeters. The effective height here, because there is prolapse, is um, point. 0.5, and we take it with a bicuspid valve of the non-fused cusp. So it's whatever is not prolapsing there. There is no commissural height because there is no coaptation. Um, and the geometric height is a bit short, only at 14 millimeters. And you'll notice for a bicuspid aortic valve, the geometric height is actually longer than for a tricuspid valve. So the surgeon went ahead and did a valve sparing procedure. Uh, they found no raphi was present. They put in a 32 millimeter Dacron graft, plicated the fused cusps and equalized both cusp heights. And this is the post-op echo. Any thoughts about this, Chris? Hmm. Um. Well, it would, it would have been interesting to see what it looked like interoperatively, but uh, I'm concerned about this jet. It may be a lot, you know, it's a little hard to judge it because it's hitting the wall, um, hitting the septum there. So I, it's a 40-year-old. I don't know whether you'd go back in and see if you can repair that. I suspect you cannot. Um, but then you're faced with, do you accept this or convert this young person to a mechanical mechanical valve. Okay, so the interop assessment was this was deemed to be moderate eccentric AI. Now, this is very hard to quantify because it's such an eccentric jet. Um, I think the question really becomes, do we think it's more than mild? And uh, I think the vote in the OR was, yes, it's more than mild because it's eccentric and seems to be wrapping around. Um, the mechanism was challenging. And, you know, when you have an eccentric jet for this type of procedure, it's either retraction of one cusp or, or prolapse of the other. And it was felt to be restriction of the fused cusp. So in this case, the surgeon chose to go back on and re-repair the valve. So, sorry, there's just an overhead announcement now. Um, so in this case, there was coaptation above the annular plane, which we wanted. The length, uh, coaptation length and effective height were, were good at 7.3 millimeters. Now there's what we think is just mild AI and the commissural angle was 175. So it seems that going back on was the right answer and there seems to be a slightly better outcome in this situation. But again, as you say, Chris, it's, it's very difficult in the operating room to make these assessments sometimes. And we're often asked to think about what the mechanism is in these situations. And that did you, in this situation, uh, did you get, maybe I missed that, did you get feedback from the surgeon what the issue was? Yeah, they, they thought they had put the post a bit too high. So there was a bit of retraction there and they took out a stitch and it seemed to resolve and, and make the, uh, the cusp co-opt better. So in this situation, the patient benefited from going back on. So it does go back to my initial com comment about getting the posts correct. And, and that, that's, uh, again, uh, always a challenging part of valve sparing surgery. All right, we're gonna close with this last case and it's kind of a fun case. Um, it's a 37 year old male who's short of breath with severe AI and a dilated left ventricle. What's the diagnosis? And you can put it in the chat because I don't know that I put a poll question on for this one necessarily, but just think of what you think the mechanism is for the AI here. You're probably thinking modified by cable. What's happening? 
All right, we'll let you think on that for a few seconds here. All right, so you look in the long axis view and um, the aortic valve in 2D looks pretty good, but when you put the color on, my gosh, there's a lot of AI. You're sort of thinking, hmm, I wonder what the mechanism of AI is in this patient. Doesn't look like there's dilatation, doesn't look like there's prolapse, doesn't look like there's restriction. What the hell's happening? So then you go to the short axis view and the answer becomes very apparent. So this is a patient with a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm of the non-coronary sinus. Um, you can see using biplane why if you cut the valve in a certain angle, you would see just normal looking long axis views. And the only way to make the diagnosis really is in short axis as shown here. I don't know if this is, hopefully this will play okay. Um, so this was one of our first applications of 3D echo in the operating room. And we were able to show this windsock deformity that's described in these non-coronary or any sinus of Valsalva aneurysms. And you can see how it looks like the windsock you would see at an airport with this triangular shape. And this is put in the surgical orientation. And you can rotate that 3D data set and actually show the orifice of the windsock as shown here. Um, so really kind of a nice application of 3D echo. So our last poll, given the echo findings, patient age and current guidelines, what operations should the patient have? Another 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and uh, share the results. 56% said valve sparing root replacement, 17% said replacement of the ascending aorta. 11% Bento and 11% AVR and 6% Frost. Okay, so in fact, uh, I think one of the answers was, was going to be root repair. So just a repair of the root, not necessarily the ascending aorta. Chris, 37-year-old um, male, symptomatic, tricuspid aortic valve, sinus of Valsalva, non-coronary non -coronary sinus aneurysm, severe AI, and a dilated LV. What would you do for your patient, Chris? Well, I think this I was did. your patient. I know. I was, I was just going to say this is looking very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think uh, I would. Uh, I think the approach here would be to to repair that uh, area where the the uh, aneurysm is and leave it at that without reimplanting coronary arteries and then hopefully that took care of any leaking of the valve. So basically, repairing that sinus and addressing okay. the aneurysm. So root so, repair, I guess that would. Right. So um, this was actually Dr. Feindel's case, and I happened to be the echocardiographer on the case, and we thought we'd close with this case. So really, um, again, it's not all about valve sparing roots all the time. It's not all about fixing the aorta or the ascending aorta. Sometimes it's just fixing the problem. And in this case, Chris managed to reconstruct the non-coronary sinus with bovine pericardium, reconstruct the right atrial wall, do a tricuspid valve septal leaflet repair in a relatively short period of time. And you can see how the 3D echo image is compared to the interop finding of that windsock deformity. Do you remember this case, Chris? I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did it go as well as you thought it would go? <laughs> yes, we had to just do a little thinking on our feet. <laughs> and plug the holes. And plug the holes, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. So this was the outcome. 
um, of this case. So I'll just show you the short axis view because that was the one that had the pathology to begin with. And you can see this uh, an actual uh, very, very good result in this patient. We got a young patient preserved his native aortic valve uh, without doing a valve sparing route. So that comes to the end of our session here. Thank you very much. And um, Chris and I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, let me just stop it.